All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday. Make sure you subscribe. Check out all the old interviews. There's a whole bunch of content up there right now. And if you think you can ask better questions of my guests, and maybe you can, or maybe you want to see these interviews before anybody else gets the chance, go down to the Patreon link in the description, pick the appropriate tier, and next thing you know, you'll be asking the questions. Speaking of asking questions, I've got a lot of questions for our guest today. Johnny Lee Middleton, best known for Sabotage and later known for the band Trans-Siberian Orchestra. That's a mouthful. We're going to talk to Johnny about that and more right after this. All right, here he is, Johnny Lee Middleton. How you doing, buddy? Good, Johnny. I was saying you've got a nice backdrop. You look like you got a nice peaceful day. Yeah, it's a nice day in the mountains hanging out. Uh, finally stopped raining. Things are drying out and uh, nice and peaceful here. Yeah, you're in North Carolina, we should point out. Yeah, I'm in the Smoky Mountains. Yeah, it sounds like a nice way to spend the day. And so, Johnny, you're Johnny Lee Middleton the third. Yes, sir. Long line of Johnny Lee Middletons. Yeah, my parents weren't very creative in the name department, but but it works. Yeah, do you have any children? Uh, no. Okay, because I was going to say, if you did, you there could would keep be a fourth. Yeah, there'd be a fourth because there's not many of those around. Yeah, right. Getting to the fourth one is, is, the, is the trickiest thing. So I want to go back. You grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. Yes, sir. And, and so when you were a kid, you were playing instruments, but you weren't playing rock instruments. You played trumpet, sax, clarinet, oboe. It wasn't until you're 14 that you got your first bass. And if, if I'm right, $35? Yeah, um, I was playing a trumpet and jazz band, and they set the bass rig behind me. And the kid playing the bass rig, his father owned the piano tuning company, and they had a family band. And he had a guitar for sale for 35 bucks, and luckily it was in tune. And uh, so I picked that up, and then I asked the band director if I could learn, you know, play that. And they, the kid that played bass actually played trumpet, too. So we switched back and forth, and then uh, I found my sister's boyfriend's uh, Black Sabbath records, hmm. and that changed everything right there. And uh, I took a, we'd take a chalkboard eraser and lean it against the album and slow it down and kind of figure out what was going on. Uh, back then, I, they didn't have electric tuners. We had tuning forks. So I'm dating myself. But, uh, yeah, I kind of figured it out on my own, basically. And it's been all downhill ever since. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's I say it all the time. Can you imagine now kids can just go on YouTube and learn how to play in, you know, a day? Oh, yeah, that would have been real easy. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Back then, you know, when you're around 15, you're kind of at that awkward state in life. And I just spent a lot of time in the bedroom trying to figure out these songs and then wound up getting in a band. And uh, when I was in my sophomore year in high school and then just kind of evolved from that and just kept playing. Yeah. And and so, yeah, you started playing in lots of little local bands when you're young. And then but I think the one that sort of people know about is Lefty. Yeah, yeah, we actually had a, a truck, a crew, and we worked every week. Uh, back then, it was load in on Monday and load out on Saturday night or sometimes Sunday night. And there was quite a good circuit down in Florida. It was it was a good opportunity to get your uh, hone your skills and learn how to play in front of people. And mostly covers, right? Or maybe all covers. It was mainly all covers. We had a handful of originals, you know, but it was mainly cover songs. Yeah. Yeah, and. You had a really glam look. I mean, you guys were really glammed out. Yeah, we were kind of poison before poison was, or they were probably doing the same thing on the different coast. But, you know, back then, who knew what was going on in California? Um, so that was kind of our thing. And uh, everyone had bleach blonde hair. and We wore makeup and a lot of Aquanet and, you know. Yeah, big hair. Big hair. That was the thing, man, in the 80s, early 80s. Yeah, and so in 1984, the guys from Sabotage come to see you play, and yeah. they they didn't really like the look, but they liked you. They wanted to hire you, and because you were making a good living, you passed, right? 
yeah at the time you know i was like well how much you know you guys getting paid a week and they're like well we have day jobs and uh, i was like well i got a, a night job <laughs> you know I'm, I'm making money playing music and i didn't really want to quit and go crawl around in attics and do duck work that's what chris oliva was doing he was doing air conditioning duck work I think Doc was working at a golf course as a uh, maintenance guy. And I think Oliva, John Oliva was doing the same thing. Yeah. John would call himself a golf pro, but he was actually probably mowing the greens. Hmm. And you're playing music and probably meeting chicks and having a good time. Oh, probably yeah. sounded more appealing. Yeah. And then that wore thin. Um, the next year they came back and asked me again and i was like yeah man let's go because they were going to london to record a record i just wanted to go to london so i was like oh heck you know i was 20 21 years old we're gonna go to london i was like yeah man i'll jump on board for that and i'm still here yeah and so and then this happens yeah fight oh, yeah. fight for the rock yeah, that was a learning experience i mean we we came over there with a really kick-ass record and at the time, the music business, there was kind of a fork in the road. And um, our management suggested we take the right fork and everyone else took the left fork. And uh, it was an interesting experience. Uh, none of us were there for the mix of the record, which was where you know everything kind of comes together or falls apart. And when we got the record back, we were like, wow, you know, kind of like. You never mix. You never missed another mix. I bet. No, no, no. We never. No, and we had bad management at the time. Um, it was bad management, bad direction. I had just jumped on board, so I was kind of clueless as you know to what was going on. But uh, there's still some strong stuff on there. It's just production-wise and the mix. It was just. It was. It was. It wasn't good. Yeah, I know you guys were definitely disappointed with this. This is Sabotage's third record. This is your first. This is 1986. Mm -hmm. And so, but you do get to go to London, you know, yeah. you, you get to uh, make the experience. And so 1987 comes around and you got, and you guys are kind of, you're one of those bands that was cranking these records out. And so 1987, Paul O'Neill gets involved with Sabotage and obviously will become a major part of that of the band you know he, essentially he's a member of sabotage um yep and uh and and not to be confused with paul o'neill of the new york yankees um tell us a little bit about getting involved with paul and as we take a look at hall of the mountain king well after uh fight for the rock we were kind of on the ropes as far as the, you know the record deal goes back then you got a 10 album deal um, it was the record label's option to pick you up for number two, number three, number four. And after the dismal, you know, sales and uh, the success or lack thereof of Fight for the Rock, we were really on the ropes. And uh, we met Paul at a show in uh, Queens Lamore back in the day. I think we were opening for Poison, and wow. uh, which is was an interesting bill. But uh, we met Paul at that time and he kind of took us under his wing and uh, he had some really good ideas and some direction that, you know, he basically saved the band. We were probably real close to being done with and he seen something in us. He seen something in Chris and John and the writing and the capabilities that we had. We just needed a, a good producer to get behind the band. And uh, when he came in, it changed everything. And uh, we wound up really putting every dime we had into that record we all slept in one little dodgy hotel at the times square motor lodge we basically ate peanut butter and jelly campbell soup uh raised pizza and uh, we knew that this was our last shot and if this record didn't work we were all going back to day jobs and so we literally put everything we had into this record nobody really took a dime i think we were all making about 15 dollars a day and uh, when we were done with the record, it was like finally something that sounds like us. And we finally found, you know, someone who understood the band and the direction that we wanted to go in. Yeah, this record begins, you get into the groove of what the sabotage sound is, is going to become. Um, 
And we should point out that Paul O'Neill, he had a very successful career in the music business before he he was uh, he worked for Lieber and Krebs, the famous management mm -hmm. team. He was a David's personal assistant for a long time. And he became a big promoter as well. He was promoting stuff like Madonna and huge acts over in Japan. So yeah. he had music experience, but he also sat in on a lot of legendary sessions and a lot of big music. And obviously he knew how to do it. And I think you guys helped him showcase as well, though, because you made a great team. Yeah, I mean, one hand washes the other. And uh, we brought out the best in him and he brought out the best in us. And, you know, he would always hear things we didn't hear. And we'd be like, what? And then we'd try it and be like, oh, yeah. And, I think know, that's the sign of a great producer, yeah. And that record, too, was when the emulator first came out. That was the first sampling, you know, that stuff that uh, that you hear on the the uh, Prelude to Madness. That's all, that's all like, state of the art. That was the first hmm. kind of sampling stuff that was done. Um, Bob Kinkle came into the mix at that point, and he was the New York, in New York City, he was the sampling guy. So he was the guru at that. And so I started bringing in some of the orchestration into the band at that point in time. Yeah. And, and it, again, something that will become a signature um, to sabotage, you know, as we uh, as we progress. So, OK, so, you know, it's funny. So things are starting to get popular. And I was watching you guys on the Headbangers Ball back then. You, you, you know, sabotage could just host the Headbangers Ball. And you guys did. And it's a it is a strange thing so so the, the the actor who's in the music video he, he's he's a little person he yep. is on the show with you and then yep. sitting on your lap is uh the playboy playmate who's now married to robin zander yep. how does this all come about <laughs> well the the actor was the guy who did the uh hall of the mountain king video with us right and so you know we brought him in and unfortunately the poor guy had to go through about another 12 hours of makeup to get back to where he was, you know, to look like that. And, uh, it, he was a super nice guy. And, uh, so we brought him in and I was dating Pam at the time. She was my girlfriend. So that's what I figured. Yeah. And so Paul's like, well, why don't you fly her up and we'll go on headbangers ball. And I was like, yeah, okay. That'll work. So we had a nice little vacation of it. And, uh, that's kind of how we got to be with that, you know, where that came to be. It was just, uh, yeah, at that time, you got the feeling that MTV would just go, yeah, okay, let the inmates run the asylum. You guys want to host? Yeah, go ahead, you know, like no TV experience, no, yeah, you could do it. And yeah, you want to have a little guy in makeup from your video and you want to have your girlfriend sit on your lap? Yeah, why not? You know? Why not? Yeah, that's the way it was done, you know. That was the way Which, it was good. Yes, I was just going to say, it was probably more fun. I also want to mention on this record, uh, the late Ray Gillen uh, mm -hmm. sang on the record as well. And so that, yeah. and what a legendary guy he became, sadly passed away. Uh, great, great singer, great guy. Yeah, and, and he's probably best known for um, for Badlands. So this record, uh, Hold the Mountain King, really starts to get some attention for you guys and some deserved attention. And you go out and you do a huge tour, I believe, is it Dio and Megadeth? Yeah, we were thrown on the stage with, uh, it was us, Megadeth, and Dio. Wow. That's, you know, that's... really thrown on the stage. That's When you're at that at our level at that point in time, I think we had a 30-minute set, mm -hmm. and there no sound check, no nothing. It was like, get up there and go. If you start five minutes late, then cut a song. You're off at 7.30. And that's that was the brutality of being in a situation like that. Um, you know, you're thrown to the wolves and you got 30 minutes, prove yourself and you can't hear anything. You can't see anything. You're just kind of hanging on. And um, after a little bit of time went by, we kind of befriended people. And back then certain things kind of got things done. If you know what I mean? Um, like cocaine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wow, yeah. It kind of got things done. And so all of a sudden you have a better monitor mix. All of a sudden your monitors are on, your lights are on. Hey, you guys need some help. You need a sound check because you got to understand the band was from Florida. So, yeah. We, we kind of figured out back early what makes the world go around. And, you know, that was the way things were done back then. It's not like that anymore, but 
we slowly started, like you said, we got sound and lights and everything went well. We were a bunch of young, crazy guys back then, and we wound up getting in some trouble. We got in some trouble with Megadeth. Uh, John and Dave got in a fight one night. Um, we got kicked off a few shows. And then at the end, we got booted off, I think, the last two or three shows when they found out where the... Uh, the stuff was coming from. <laughs> it's well, so, so okay. Well, now, now, now we're interesting. All of a sudden, this story turns into Scarface. So, yeah, yeah. So those guys were fighting. What were they fighting about? Oh, with the with the Mustaine and Oliva fight. Yeah. Oh, uh, we were all in a hotel. I think Oliva. I think he was drinking a bottle of Stoli, and Mustaine was drinking a bottle of Jack, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that was the way it was done. I mean, I mean, they drink a whole bottle and uh, everyone was partying and doing our thing and it was time to call it a night. And I don't think Dave wanted to stop. And it turned into Dave picking up a chair. We were in one of those like holiday inns with the glass windows. It wasn't a, you know, we drive up to the front of your room. Mm -hmm. So he, he picks up this chair and tries to throw it through the plate glass window and it just bounces off of it. So Oliva just picks them up and basically throws them against the wall. And uh, he kind of, when he hit the wall, his head was kind of down towards the ground. And so when he landed, he kind of landed on his head. And uh, then he got up and stumbled across the room or the open door, out, out the open door, across the hallway, and hit his head on the room across the hall from us. And... Uh, he was supposed to ride on the bus with us the next night to the next next gig, and that didn't happen. And uh, when I think we got to Indianapolis, and uh, their management was quite pissed at us, and they're like, "You guys are off for a couple of nights," so they kicked us off a couple of nights, and everything kind of you know smoothed out after that. And but so there was some mean? crazy crazy stuff went on on that tour. Yeah, I mean, what do you do those nights? Do you get stuck in some city? You don't go home, do you? No, nah, you get stuck in a hotel and sit around, eat. Think about what you've done. Well, think about what someone else has done, and you're <laughs> on the hook for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, you didn't drink Stolly. They were no. Yeah, well, we were all involved, but um, those two were had a little problem. Yeah, I get it. So now you say at the end of that tour. They find out where it comes from. So are they mad that maybe your supply, not you personally, and I think the statute of limitations has passed, but is that <laughs> what they're mad about? Uh, well, it was that and just a combination of things, uh, you know, just being young and crazy rockers doing stuff, you know, not following the rules, just being dumb and young. It was That was the way we were. I mean, we were dumb and young. When we signed with Atlantic, we were in, you know, I think I was 21, 22 years old. Right. So we were all kids and uh, doing what kids do. I think sometimes sabotage kind of went under the radar with some of these things. I mean, you know, you're not known as this party band or whatever. You know, the music is taken very serious. I, so I don't think people... And your fans are very passionate. You know, sabotage fans are passionate, yeah. but you know, you didn't, you weren't making these headlines. So when you hear the stories now, you think, "Wow, these guys were were pretty crazy." Yeah, I mean, it it didn't. We didn't act like that very long. Um, we got reeled in real fast. So I mean, we we had a couple of tours where we were, you know, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, man, twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got reeled in, and we grew up, and we got out of it. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's probably a good thing. Okay, we're looking at the gutter ballet. I've got to tell my uh, gutter ballet s a story, mm -hmm. which is I'm, I'm growing up in New York City. Uh, I'm trying to be an actor. I've got an agent, and my agent tells me, we want to send you on an audition for a music video for a band called Sabotage. So I said, <laughs> okay. well, I said well, that's great. And so it was the, the casting agent was down in the village where the video was shot. And it was it was like one of these addresses that nobody knew how to find. New York's a great city for having the grid. You know, the yeah. avenues go one way, the streets go the other way. But when you get to downtown, you start to get the names. And yeah. there's no GPS. And I remember getting off the subway and walking past Washington Square Park. And I think it was like Ludlow Street or Bond Street. And, and 
it was, it, you know, you're asking people which way is this, which way is that. And it was, it was night. And so they probably saw hundreds of people. You know, you guys are probably thinking now that's where all our money went, uh, you know, into these ridiculous videos. So needless to say, I did not get the call back for the video, but I've heard some of the stories about the video. So you tell me what that experience was like for Gutter Ballet. I was the coldest thing I've ever been through in my life coming from Florida. Mm -hmm. I think it was, uh, it might have been zero degrees, and we filmed it all night long. And it was, uh, I remember it was down in like that, where it was like Avenue D and, at, you know, that Alphabet, Alphabet City. City. I think it's called. Yeah, there were syringes and stuff laying everywhere. We had to do a syringe cleanup before we went on site. Um, there was a shooting houses where, you know, the shooting galleries where people were literally walking up makeshift ladders into abandoned second floor, you know, units and I guess doing their thing in there. And um, it was cold. It was just flipping as cold as you can imagine. And basically all night long, you're up from the time it, you know, you start around dark and you finish when the sun comes up and it was pretty brutal but when you look at that video you kind of see what how tso was born absolutely you, know, you see the guys with the violins down there chugging along you see the rock band in the background you see the pyro you basically see the seed of tso this was formed back that that long ago that was you know one of paul's visions he wanted to be the walt disney of rock and put on these massive productions where you could bring your family and uh, you would walk out of there going, man, that was awesome. I can't wait to go back. And yeah. that was kind of the, where you could see the seed of TSO was yeah, planted. You definitely do. And it, and, and it is a cool looking video. Later people would realize, so, you know, they would put a casting thing out and say, this takes place in a really bad neighborhood. Nowadays you'd film that on a stage or, take a nice neighborhood and make it look bad. But back then it was just like, well, that's where we have to go. Cause yeah. And so yeah. you have this lowest common denominator of squatters and junkies and characters surrounding you all night while it's freezing out, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, we didn't have to I mean, make any, you know, scene. You just had to show up and go, let's do it there. Mm -hmm. it, it was already man-made. It was, that's all natural what you see. Yeah, and yeah, for sure. And so MTV picks up this this video, and the, the band is getting more popular. This is a time where if you can get a video through, you're gonna you're gonna keep climbing. Even though you guys had a really hardcore fan base, you're now making um, new fans. And so explain to me Chris Caffery's involvement because he always comes and goes in Sabotage. It never seems like he was he was he always brought on to be a touring guitar player. Well, at the time. Um we started adding the orchestration. We stat, you know, started adding all this stuff, but we're, we're a three piece band mm -hmm. basically. And John had just started playing keyboards and we were going out with Testament and a nuclear assault. And we needed another, we needed a rhythm guitar player. Actually, um, I believe Chris was out on the deal run with us. He was kind of backstage playing rhythm parts. I, I meant, and, I meant to ask you that. I, I heard yeah. that. Yep. Yeah, he was he was behind the scenes, you know, when Chris would go into a lead, he'd chug the rhythm because it, it's kind of hard, you know, being a three piece metal band. Um, when he goes into the lead, the bottom drops out. So we brought him in on that. And then he started slowly kind of creeping around the stage. And then it's got all right, dude, just come on, get on the deck with us and we'll put you in the band. And that's kind of how he came along as you know we needed some help paul knew him paul had worked with him with a, a thing called big mouth i think it was and, yeah uh, big mouth that's funny yeah that was a another yeah year. so yeah. paul suggested bringing him in and you know he came down to florida and we were like yeah man he fit in nice guy he could play and so he wound up you know coming in and and, and doing that and playing and he toured with us on the gutter tour and then after that, he kind of wanted he wanted to do his own thing. So he, he went off and did his own thing and we just carried on. Yeah. And so here we are. Streets, a rock opera. This is a 68 minute record. So this really is a uh, rock opera. And again, growing with the Sabotage brand and leaning, like you said, towards uh, Trans-Siberian as well. 
yeah uh with with this and yeah it, it is funny when you see a record like this with four people on the cover when you know that this is a big you know orchestrated mm -hmm. thing yeah well those four guys recorded all of it and that was that's it you know we didn't uh we didn't bring well bob kinkle was with us you know he helped out but yeah that's those four guys did all that work and the, the first the way the record we wanted it to be was the narration in between every song that right. was the whole idea behind it and uh i don't know where it got shot down if uh paul changed his mind or if the label said no we don't like that so we only used the first snippet of narration on it and then eventually we did release it with everything on it but we spent a lot of time on that on that record and we kind of ran out of money towards the end of it and so in my opinion the 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 mastering and the production on some songs we we spent a lot of time on certain songs and not so much on other songs so the it, I, I thought the the sounds weren't as good as they were on the Mountain King record or the Gutter record, but we also put a lot more music in it. And so, I mean, you have, like you said, 70 minutes worth of music versus maybe 45 on another one. So, yeah. And this, this is 1991. Do you guys feel pressure from the grunge thing as well? I felt like heavier bands were able to survive a little better. Yeah, that was at an odd time when the record industry was kind of, you know, taking a dive because there were so many bands that actually Streets was the first record we did digitally, but uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first one that we did digital. And uh, we didn't really feel any pressure because they that was a whole different genre. But I mean, it was taken off, you know, the Pearl Jams and the Nirvanas and stuff. But we just stuck to what we did and did did our thing. And uh, it was one of those records, you know, the critics liked it and the fans were like, eh. And so it didn't really do as well as we thought it would do. Um, but that's the way a lot of things are, you know. Yeah. Um, but you guys stayed at it where a lot of bands at that point were starting to uh, separate. This is Edge of Thorns. And mm -hmm. this is also where, um, you know, unfortunately sabotage is filled with uh, some some triumph but also some tragedy and mm -hmm. that is where this uh, starts to begin so we're looking at the record cover here um and this this is dawn oliva which was chris's wife it, yeah. obviously the artist um painted her painted her or however this was made and so um and, and now it gets weird because now zach stevens starts to come into the picture after this record's done right yeah john wanted to focus more on writing and so him and paul kind of teamed up and really just start they they were started writing a lot of stuff he wanted to get off the road and uh our guitar tech dan was friends with zach and he you know he said this guy would fit you guys man he's a nice guy and a good singer i think zach was working at a hotel in hollywood california hmm. And uh, we wound up flying him to Florida and we did a couple songs with him. And we was like, yeah, and he's a hell of a drummer, too. So I was like, he, he really fit in. And, you know, so that was a whole different band. And at that point in time, Doc Kildrums, he kind of left us standing at the altar. Um, he had a business going on the side and he decided he didn't want to tour. So he left me in a situation where I got to find a drummer and, you know, we got a tour and blah, blah, blah. And it wound up being me and Chris basically owned the company. And uh, we hired on, you know, Andy James at the time to play drums. And we ha hired this kid, Wes Guerin, to play, you know, guitar. And the band started to get some really good airplay. And that was back when Z-Rock and stuff was really killing and uh, we started to get a lot of FM airplay and we started to go somewhere and we had a real successful sum summer run and we had some time off. Uh, we were getting ready to go out with actually Vince Neal. We were going to open up with Vince for Vince Neal. And then I got the knock on my door and that was it. Changed. Yeah. And so um, obviously what you're saying is um, so Chris Oliva tragically 
was killed in a car accident by a drunk mm-hmm. driver. Um, he was hit head on. What yeah. makes it even uh, uh, just more uh, ridiculous and makes even more angry is that this the man who who, who, who killed him uh, had seven prior dr- drunk driving offenses. There's no way this person should have had a license. And then even after what he does, he spent barely any time. In, I think maybe 18 months in prison. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just a, just a, um, just a terrible uh, situation. And so, yeah, you find out by a knock on your door, it's a different time, you know, this yeah. point texting. And so who, who tells you this awful news that Chris is gone? Well, a state trooper, um, Chris was, uh, like we had, we lived in an, uh, these apartments and he lived across the street from me. So, uh, I was getting ready to go play golf and I uh, hear a knock on my door. And I thought it was my buddy. And I opened the door and it says, big black state trooper. I was like, oh, shit. My wife must have crashed the car last night. You know, my first thought is what she hit um, because she wasn't actually the best driver. And uh, the guy, um, he's like, do you know Chris Oliva? And I was like, yeah, why? And he goes, "Uh, I need to get a hold of his parents. And I was like well why you know and he's like he was in an accident last night and i was like is he okay and he's like i i, I just got on shift you know obviously he couldn't tell me so right. uh, i gave him his father's number and then uh the manager of the apartment place yeah no i, I, know, I know it's a, a tough thing to talk about and it's not something that ever uh is going to get easier so uh so you don't have to go into it. I get it. Yeah, the guy comes over and he's like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, what? You know, what happened? He's like, uh, you know, Chris was killed. And I was like, what? Couldn't believe it. And, you know, it was it was hard because he's got a dog and a cat. You know, I got to go over there and like, you know, take care of his stuff. And it, Yeah, and his wife was in the car with him, right? Yeah, and... And to add to the tragedy, I I think it sounds because his wife passed away in, in, I think, 2005. It sounds as if she was never able to. No, she never got over it. Um, I don't think any of us will, you know. Um, Was it did. Do we know the cause of death from his wife? Um, I think she OD'd. Yeah. I think that's what it was. Yeah, I mean, she she struggled. She had health issues after that, you know, um, some serious health issues. And then um, she she had some substance abuse issues. And eventually, I believe she succumbed to that. But yeah, it was tough, man. It was real, real hard time because all of a sudden, you know, we're done. It's like, what what do you do now? Uh and we, it, you know, that's when we did the the next record. Yeah. Well, and and that next record I know becomes extremely difficult for you because um, the, the, well, the story goes that you came into the studio and saw his his guitar or his rig and just could could uh, the, the record called Handful of Rain, and you just you couldn't do it. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I walked in and um, like all of his stuff was there, and I turned around to John and, and I called him Gerb. I said where's Gerb at? And then I was like, oh, man. you know, I forgot. I, you know, I forgot that he was dead. And uh, I was like, I can't do this, man. I'm useless. So I, I booked it. You know, they called me, come on, man, come on back. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't do it, man. I'm not ready. And so uh, they did the record and then it was time to tour. And I was like, I got a tour. So that's when we brought Skolnick in. So right. You know, to do that. Well, and that record, John pretty much did everything. He played the bass, yeah. he played the drums. And I, I it, you know, it seems like he did this as a tribute to his brother, you know, to make it even, he's not just a bandmate, he's, a, he's, he's his brother. And Skolnick plays the solos on that record. Yep. And, uh, and yes, and you do come back to tour um, for that record. Yeah, that was hard. It was the first few nights were hard. Um, it was tough, but you got to get back on the horse, man. You know, that's he, he would have wanted us to continue on. So, yeah. And, and you guys continue to honor his legacy. It's tragic that he was gone too soon, 
but uh, sabotage he will always be obviously a part of the sabotage oh yeah yeah he's with us every night so. yeah and at this time jeff plate comes in to play drums a little after and he will stay as the drummer he becomes a part of of sabotage yeah jeff had worked with uh zach in a band called wicked witch up in boston and uh he came down and he you know to do an audition and he played a few songs i was like he's got it and he's a super nice guy super solid drummer and he wanted the gig and so he wound up sticking around and then it was uh you know what that after that you know it was oh, john came back so it was a zach john me and chris and jeff going at it yeah 1995 dead winter dead and again you guys are, are back sort of on schedule every couple of years you're going to get these these records out yeah yeah we we kept cranking them out and uh this record changed everything you know we went in it with like kind of half a band it was me and john and jeff and zach and didn't really we had chris we didn't have a lead guitar player other than you know chris was playing lead and uh i remember we went to this one studio and we recorded a bunch of stuff but the guys were really stoned they smoked a lot of dope and uh a lot of stuff got mixed up and just mixes mixed up and parts mixed up and paul was not very happy he pulled us out of there we wound up at another studio i believe it was studio 900 and uh we heard all doing this in new york and uh we finally got the the thing done and um we still didn't have a lead guitar player we had all the tracks done and then um we wound up getting a hold of al and al came down paul al, Light, Petra al petrelli who played yep. with alice cooper that's where he kind of broke in and yep. you know Megadeth as well later. And the funny thing is, is I was in Florida. Al was doing all of the guitar tracks. The first time I met Al was at our photo shoot for this record. It was the first time I met him. It was like, hey, how are you? I'm your guitar player. Hey, how you doing, buddy? This is the beginning of Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Yeah, well, well, what had happened was, you know, Paul had this idea about this rock opera and, uh, one of the scenes in Paul's head, which was a true story, uh, there was this, I met the guy, it was a cello player who would go play his cello in the city center square while, you know, there's bombing and bullets flying and stuff. And he was like, he wouldn't give up. He'd sit down there every evening and play his cello and it was around Christmas time. So O'Neill had this idea about doing this, you know, Carol of the Bells. And so when we recorded the song, none of us thought it would ever make it on the album. It was like, yeah, okay. Cause we, you know, you record 20 songs, you use 10. That's kind of the way it worked. And then uh, it got down to the, you know, we got to make a decision. And I remember it was me and John and we were at soundtrack studio in New York city. And he's like, he, me and John didn't want it on the record. Um, Paul did. And we always had a democracy, you know, so if there's three people voting and two people vote, yes, pff, you're off the island. So uh, we're arguing and arguing and Paul, we're like, no, we don't want it on there. John's like, I don't want it on there. I don't want it on there. And then Paul looks at John and he goes, I'll give you $300 if you let me put this song on the record. And Oliva goes, really? And he goes, yeah, Paul whips out three $100 bills. And I just looked at Oliva and I was like, you're such a dick. But that was the best thing he ever did. Well, that was the best $300 ever spent. Yeah, yeah. Got, this is about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. We're having this argument. And uh, so that was, it was a wrap. Is it in the end of the night and we get in the cab and I'm like, man, you're such a dick. I can't believe you sold out. You know, and he did. And then, uh, I remember being, I think we were in Europe touring and I talked to my ex-wife and she's like, they're playing your Christmas song on Mix 96. And I'm like, what? That's like a Whitney Houston channel, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, sure enough, it was getting airplay by a local DJ down in Florida by the name of Mason Dixon. And he just so happened to have a friend, a, fr a friend named Scott Shannon that lived in New York City. Yeah, so he told yeah, he told Scott about the song. Scott started spinning it. 
And the next thing we know, we got, you know, phones are blowing up. Who's this band? And everyone, you know, really loved the song. But when they bought the album and they heard this metal band, they were like, it kind of like, it doesn't make any sense. So Atlantic approached Paul and asked if, you know, what about doing a whole Christmas record? And uh, so they basically just changed the name of the band and used that as an anchor song and did a Christmas album. I remember as TSO was growing, uh, telling my friends, you know, that's a heavy metal band called Sabotage, you know, because it was sort of separated. But And yeah. then it became an East Coast Trans-Siberian, a West Coast. This thing is huge. And obviously, I mean, we're in a weird time right now. Um, mm -hmm. Is it supposed to go out this year? Yeah. 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 We're going out as of today, you know. Right. You know I get it. Anything can yeah. happen. But, um, but yeah, that is the plan. But it's amazing the life that this uh, – has brought and people love it. And people who have no idea what sabotage is or, or even heavy metal music. And it's so funny because so it's, it's you and Jeff uh, is involved. And then we have Chris is involved, Al Petrelli. So you have, you know, a, a, a potpourri of sabotage <laughs> mixed in. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the sabotage guys, but we had to put half of us West and half of us East. So, so kind of, it's kind of what we did with it because the de the demand of the touring is is you know we can only really tour from like the second week in November to maybe New Year's, mm -hmm. so you can't cover the whole country with one band. And yeah, so and we you've got great guys in both bands. You know, my friend Bloss Bloss Elias from Slaughter, oh, yeah. he's in the West Coast version, and so you really do. Obviously, you get quality musicians, and it it it's obviously something fun. Uh, for everybody to see, and a tradition that continues. And Sabotage was still, even though TSO makes six records, um, you know, it's uh, you still get a little bit of uh, Sabotage. You guys kind of kept it going. Uh, the Wake of Magellan, that's 97. Yeah. And that's probably going to be it for a minute. Um, you, it's not the end. I'm sure at that point, Trans-Siberian is taking up um, – a lot, a lot of your time and for and, and, yeah and for good reason here is what would be considered the last sabotage record poets and madmen um and this is uh al petrelli's gone i think chris caffrey's playing most of the guitar in this record right yeah i think uh al came in and did a couple a lead couple solos on it but the majority of the work is is caffrey on that one and uh and so this sort of leaves things open for Sabotage fans, at least, to wonder what is going to happen. Now, in 2017, Paul O'Neill passes away, and I know that's a big part of both of the Trans-Siberian Sabotage family. He had, uh, he had a lot of health issues um, um, towards, towards the end of his life. And mm -hmm. so, um, so the question, obviously, that you know I'm going to ask, because everyone always asks, you guys got back together in 2015, uh, mm -hmm. I believe. You did a, a festival show. And so I think what people want to know, and again, we're in an uncertain time, but it's do you think Sabotage will uh, make a record or play shows again? Uh, I'd say yes to both, yeah. I would say yes to both. Now when is anybody's guess? But before Paul passed, we had talked about doing another Sabotage record. And uh, uh, Oliva handed me a CD full of songs. Um, it was, you know, we were talking about doing it. And then, you know, things happened with Paul and tragedy struck. And at that point in time, everything was put on hold. And, uh, you know, we're trying to navigate legal things and all this stuff's going on. And, you know, is TSO going to tour again? When you uh, say... When you say legal things, you mean like with labels or what is the? I would just space? everything in general. You know, uh, the the pilot of the of the plane is gone. There's right. a lot of things that need to be figured out. You know, where okay. we're going to land. You know, how much fuel's on board. Uh, you know, there's a lot of logistical things and stuff like that that has to be worked out. Um, so it, you know, it was a shock to all of us when 
when Paul passed and everything just kind of got put on hold, we had to kind of focus on, okay, now the guy that pretty much comes up with all the ideas and everything, he's gone. Right. So our focus went from what we were going to do to what we have to do. And that's where we're at now is what, what do we have to do? And we figured out we can do the touring. Um, we got to get through this year. Right. Uh, there's so many uncertains. It's it's hard to say when something's going to happen, but I can pretty much tell you there there will be some more stuff to listen to, and there will be some more guys to see up there jumping around. Just hope we're not in our seventies when it happens. Yes, that I, I, I hope so. I hope that doesn't happen either. Uh, but yeah, the the idea is there. And the guys yeah. are willing, and John is interested again, and there is music being circulated. Like you said, there is music that was recorded. And so hopefully this world can get back to some uh, normalcy or whatever it is, and uh, and we'll see. And I, and I know that fans want it. And I think it's great yeah. now because now you can do both. I, I know that Trans Siberian's paying some bills. You, you know what I mean? Um, so it's great that you can then have sabotage and keep your same components. You know, what, yeah. what a great the thing about sabotage is is we want to do it like Trans-Siberian Orchestra at that level. And with TSO, we could sell out. I could go into uh, Sacramento and I could sell that building out twice. And I could roll out of there with 24, 25,000 tickets sold. Mm -hmm. Now, if sabotage went to Sacramento to play, I'd be lucky if I could do 2,500 people. So you got to understand, you know, that's kind of where we are in the world is we want to be able to do the sabotage in front of 25,000 people. Yeah. That's kind of where we're at with it. And I, I think we can get there. Um, we got to get some new music out. Uh, there's new music. Um, it's good stuff. It's just a matter of, we basically got all the pieces to the puzzle. We just got to put it, put it together. And that's where we are with it. Yeah, which, which is great. I mean, the future, you know, as, as weird as it is, the future still is also bright. And so mm -hmm. um, that's a good thing. What else do you, have you been working on, Johnny? Do you, I know you play in other bands and do other things too, like maybe side projects? Yeah, I just, uh, well, a couple days ago, uh, Ronnie Monroe, um, the guy from Metal Church, he sang with us on a TSO, a couple TSO tours. He's released uh, some stuff me and Caffrey played on. Um, I did a record. I'm playing in a local band here up in, from Hiawassee, Georgia, Georgia called uh, Whiskey Stills and Mash. Mm -hmm. And we put a record out uh, the first of the year. And it's a good Southern rock. If you like good Southern rock record, yes, it's good Southern rock. It kind of sounds like the area looks, I guess you could say, you know, mm -hmm. the music is very fitting for you would think a band that came from this area would sound like that. And we, we play out every weekend. We have a lot of fun. We do a lot of cover stuff, uh, a lot of original stuff. we we'll play biker things, uh, car shows, local bars, wing joints. Um, we play a lot around here. It's a lot of fun. We got some good gigs coming up for the combat vets. We do their bike rally. Um, do some bike rallies down in Panama city and you know, a lot of, a lot of good, got, we have a lot of good songs. We have a lot of good fans, good following and it's good stuff. I was playing the upright bass up here doing contra wow. music. When I first moved here, I kind of immersed myself in the Appalachian music and uh, playing a lot of, um, they have contra dances here, which is, kind of you're playing irish jigs and irish reels okay and it's a kind of a way long a lost way of life but uh when covid hit you know they kind of closed that up because when you contra dance you basically touch every guy is going to touch every girl in that room that's mm. the way it works sounds it's, like my kind of dance yeah well back in the day that was the way people you know met people courted people you know met their loved ones was Old school, you know, contra dancing. Yeah, and this is like long that. before uh, the Lombada, the forbidden dance. Of <laughs> long before telephones, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, you go up and dance on somebody. Um, 
I'm going to put a link to that music as well. So people can check that out, you know, uh, in addition to sabotage and trans Siberian, but I think, you know, some people would like to see something different and it's great that you have that project and you have something local that you can do while the world is in its place. Yeah. I mean, I live pretty much in isolation, just about off the grid and, uh, nothing's changed up here in the woods as far as, you know, this COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. And we basically, you know, we're a three piece band and we all looked at each other. And it's like, you guys want to bag it or you want to just roll. And so we rolled, um, we didn't, you know, we all knew we eventually we were going to get it. We did a new year's gig. We all got COVID. Um, so I got it. Everyone had it. Um, I was pretty much asymptomatic. My, drummer was sick and so we just kind of dealt with it and we don't really have to mask up here um you know it's a different world i live in a very small county in cherokee county here it's i think we've had 40 deaths maybe 42 deaths from well and you don't have new people coming in and out you're not in a tourist spot you know so well yeah we are there's a lot of cabins here so oh, okay so people are renting yeah yeah, a lot of people from Florida come up here. Um, it's about 12 hours from the Tampa Bay area. So we, they call them Floridians here, and I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a lot of people from Florida have relocated up here. And, gotcha. Well, uh, just so from it's, over your shoulder, it looks not, It looks beautiful to me, you know. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice area. I keep bees. I'm a master beekeeper, and I teach some wounded warriors and, you know, other guys beekeeping and it keeps me real busy man how the hell did you get into that oh uh, actually my neighbor over here is dr Kildrums. he lives across the way from me and uh when i bought this land and built the house he's like why don't we get some bees and i was like yeah that sounds like it'd be kind of cool i figured it'd be like growing tomatoes or something like that and uh quickly realized no man this is it's pretty hard um so I, I got into this master beekeeping program at the North Carolina State University and uh, kind of worked my way through that. And then uh, now I just actually just started my LLC a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to uh, go into business doing it. So how great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, we, we talked all this heavy metal and history and news these websites will run the the headline Johnny Lee Middleton master beekeeper you know that that'll be what uh that'll be what what stands out but uh uh but yeah how cool and you you've definitely found ways to occupy your time and hopefully yeah. well and you probably are getting ready for TSO it's probably not too far off as of now yeah we're not far off at all um we generally leave around halloween so we still have plans. They called me a couple of weeks ago and asked me, you know, if I needed to upsize or downsize any of my wardrobe. Um, like now my pants still fit. So we're good to go. You're doing good then. Yeah. Then you've made the most of your time. Yeah. I can't wait to get back on the road. This is my first year home in 21 years for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. And that, it must have been a strange feeling. Well, what was strange was walking in the lows and looking at Christmas lights. It was, it was like someone like I'd been in prison for 20 years and then they let me out to go Christmas light shopping because I was like, what are those? It's like, what? Wireless Christmas lights, you know, batteries. Yeah. You're used to just showing up and that stuff is on the stage. You didn't think uh, that you back, back when I was doing it, we had those twisty bulbs. Yes. I, uh, yeah. I, I sold my Christmas stuff back in the 90s. Now it's probably vintage. Yeah, well, I don't have any of it, but yeah, it's uh, it it was it was good to be home for Christmas, but one Christmas in twenty one years is enough. I'm ready to get back on the bus. Ready to get back on the road, and people want that experience. It's as I said, it's for it's important to people, and it's a family experience. And so, uh, hopefully, I've literally watched kids come through the line. They were about four years old, and now they're coming through the line with their four year olds. Crazy. You never we've been doing it. Yeah, you never could have uh, uh, imagined. And, and through the all the years of sabotage, you never could imagine this is where it was going to head. So now if you told me I'd be playing Christmas music wearing a tuxedo, I told you you were crazy. But uh, you know what? It's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. 
Johnny, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Uh, I think we, we covered a lot of great stuff and I think people will really be interested. And uh, so I definitely appreciate it. And I'll link everything down below. So people want to find out about TSO, they want to listen to your new music, they can do all those things. Yeah, man, it was awesome talking to you, man. A good wasting some time with you. Yes, I appreciate it. I felt like we had a nice leisurely waste of time. And I wish I was, uh, I, I, you know what? I wish I was out there. It looks much nicer than here today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice day today. Can't complain. Yeah. All right, Johnny, thank you so much. Thank you. You have a great day.